there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of hate out there. And um, and the networks make it, the social networks make it very, very easy to spread. In fact, they make more money when it spreads. And, um, you know, the more people click, the more people, you know, have eyeballs, the more money that they make. And if you've seen the, the, uh, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, mm -hmm. um, super scary, um, you know, that the idea that we are, we consumers are the product. Hello everyone, welcome to this new episode of Unfinished Business. Uh, today I'm here with Stephanie Schwab. Uh, I'm really glad that, that, that you uh, gave me this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, sure. So um, thank you so much, Roham. I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, I, you've been my student now for a couple of years and I've really enjoyed your work. And this is just an extension of your of your brilliance. I think it's really cool that you're doing this. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, so I am a marketing agency owner. I've been doing digital marketing since before the turn of the century. That sounds like a long time. Um, but since uh, 97, 98, maybe even a little before that, I've been working to help companies transition from offline to online and then doing pure digital marketing for about the last 15, 16, 17 years maybe. And um, I own my own marketing agency, Cracker Jack Marketing. We started 11 years ago. And we're a fully online virtual business. We've been doing the work at home thing since long before COVID. Um, and I have a team of about, I think there's seven of us now full time and a few contractors part time around the world. So we all work at home. We, our clients are around the world. I haven't even met most of our clients in person. And that, I think that's the way of the world now. And um, all B2B. You, you uh, always been B2B with Cracker Jack Marketing? Uh, well, we, we're B2B in that we um, are hired by businesses. Mm -hmm. So we market ourselves B2B. Most of our clients are B2C clients. So they are they are marketing to consumers. Um, so we do, have a, we do have a couple of clients that are B2B, meaning that they're looking to, to get other businesses as customers. But most of our clients are looking to get consumers as customers. So as you said, I would say you, you would be a pioneer in this in this industry so you've been here since the the, the, the very first day to me uh, someone who was basically born into this this social media world uh, it seems like it's shaking the fabric of society basically uh, whether it's in my own in my own country in america and europe everywhere politically socially there seems to be a lot of massive massive change that no one would have even be believed 20 years ago are you worried at all or do you see any long-term negative things about it yeah a, a few years ago um maybe just before the 2016 elections in the united states so 2015 2014 2015 i was starting to really feel despair about my work i was working uh, my agency focuses on social media and content marketing and influence marketing and so we do work a lot with the big platforms facebook and twitter and Instagram and um, other platforms. And um, I was starting to see this incredible shift of um, fractionalism and um, silos happening on the big platforms, which have only gotten worse in those intervening years. I mean, worse and worse and worse. And I was really depressed in like 2015, 2016. Um, well, particularly depressed after the election in 2016, if I'm honest, because um, I was not, 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 pleased with the way that things went. Um, but I was I was personally depressed that um, I was doing work that seemed to be causing some of that um, unrest and negative impact on society. Like here I was where my business was dependent on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google. And, um, and I could not, I was really struggling to see the value that I was bringing to the world beyond contributing to the mess of those social platforms. And it took me a while to really reckon with that. And, and um, a couple of years of sort of, I wouldn't say despair, but I was certainly like just really down on my business and the kind of work that we were doing. Um, pleased with our quality of work. I think we've always done amazing work um, in spite of my misgivings sometimes. 
Um, but in the last few years, I've really, I, I've undertaken a journey of personal growth and personal self-development. Um, and I'm doing some, some growth work and coaching. And um, I've been part of a growth lab for a couple of years. And as a result, I've really started to understand my own purpose. And my purpose is to make a difference. And when I started to look at, to make a difference to people, really, um, when I started to look at what my work was, I started to understand it from a slightly different perspective. Yes, we're utilizing the platforms. Yes, we're utilizing Facebook and Twitter and, and Google and all of that. And I have some issues with the ways that the platforms are performing and, and behaving at the moment. We can get into that a little bit more. Um, but I also see the work that we do as company building, that the fact that we're able to help companies get their products and services to the market builds companies and allows my clients to have great jobs and allows them to hire more people and allows companies to grow. And especially because most of our clients are not publicly traded. We have one publicly traded company, but most of the rest of them are not. Like their mission is to grow their companies. It's not to, to serve shareholders. And so when we are specifically working with those businesses where they are, you know, startups, um, occasionally a family business, but usually a startup or, um, you know, a business that is growing and emerging, that's exciting and it is creating things. When it's run by normal people, not necessarily psychopaths on Wall Street. <laughs> yes, yeah, pretty much. Yes, yes, yes. You know, when, 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 you know, people are looking to like really grow something great. And that's what we want to be part of. And so I've started to shift our sales strategy and we've started to shift our, um, you know, all of our marketing focus to market the agency to really try to attract those, I would say, medium to large businesses that are not publicly traded necessarily, where really their missions are to grow great companies. Um, because that's when we feel really good about what we're doing. And that's how I sort of get out of this, like, I'm not a mercenary, you know, I'm not just trying to make money for companies, which of course we are doing, but it's more than that. It's growing those companies. It's creating, creating cool things. But others in your industry are necessarily being the, being the good guys here. That's... There are plenty of other companies out there, plenty of other social media agencies and marketing agencies generally who are happy to make a buck doing whatever. And, you know, they will sell anything to anyone, whether it's a good product or a bad product, whether it helps somebody or doesn't help them. If Even if it's taking their money, they're happy to do it. And I am definitely not. And so all of the companies that we work with are ethical. Uh, you know, we, we put a premium on businesses that are run by or at least marketing to women or minorities. Um, we really want to work with what we call, and I'm going to put this in quotes because it's different for everybody, good companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't want to work with fly by night, you know, businesses that are just in, in it for the buck. But how do we fix this on the bigger picture, let's say? <laughs> how do we prevent, you know, our social media to social media use from, you know, leading to some unnecessarily unnecessary political upheaval, let's say, or unnecessary social social pain, let's just call it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so if we go back to the, to the platforms, if we go back to social media, um, I'm increasingly concerned with how it foments hate in the world, you know, with the misinformation and the lies that are spread and the ways that... Um, bad actors, both foreign and domestic, can infiltrate, seemingly infiltrate the platforms and get their messages spread. Now, frankly, I'm as concerned about like Fox News in the United States as I am about Facebook. I think they're both evil. You know? Or CNN. Mm -hmm. Or CNN. Uh, CNN's more neutral than Fox. <laughs> More, it's significantly more neutral than Fox. Um, but it, it, either way, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of hate out there. And, um, and the networks make it, the social networks make it very, very easy to spread. In fact, they make more money when it spreads. And, um, you know, the more people click, the more people, you know, have eyeballs, the more money that they make. And if you've seen the, the, uh, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, mm -hmm. Um, super scary, um, you know, that the idea that we are, we consumers are the product. And if we're the product, then um, we are, then they are not 
news platforms. They are not the media. They should not have media protections. Uh, I believe that they should be regulated at least to um, have, they should maybe break them up. Maybe they're a little bit of a monopoly um, and to have the algorithms being with some oversight that I want to know, I as a consumer want to know, and I as someone who works in social media wants to know, like, why is it that it, that the networks are now, in, the social networks are entirely pay for play? Like, I cannot get organic content seen ever as a, as a brand or very, 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 you know, very little, um, aware, uh, very little, uh, very few eyeballs on organic content. And, and that to me is monopolistic behavior, right? It's saying that we are the only place you can go. And so you must pay us for the privilege of having your stuff seen. And so if they're broken up or if they're regulated, um, my hope is that, that, ha that less of that happens and that it will be less easy to spread misinformation so quickly and for the person with the highest bid. Did you expect Google and Amazon and Facebook to become this big, let's say, 10, 15 years ago? Because, for example, I remember when I joined the Internet, you know, I, I guess I was six or seven. Um, I also had another barrier. Was, the Iranian government had a lot of censorship on the Internet. But I was like, OK, f first of all, the first search engine that I used was Yahoo. And then after a few months, my dad's friend was like, why are you using Yahoo? Use Google. But anyway, I was like, Google is the search engine. Then there's Wikipedia where I can find a lot of cool stuff. Then there is you know, YouTube was banned, for example. Eventually, it became that Google is not just a search box. It's like, it's your email, it's your writing, it's your presentation, it's your finances, it's your every single aspect of your life is either Google or Apple or Amazon. Yep, yep, or Facebook. Or well, I try to limit that. So yeah, for now, for Facebook for me <laughs> is only WhatsApp. But even that, I'm not very happy about. I, I'm trying to get my friends to transition to Telegram, for example. Yeah, but. Um, did you expect this at all? Where did it go wrong? Yeah. Okay. Your premise is that it went wrong. I, I don't disagree with that premise. So, um, but um, but a lot of people could say, no, it didn't go wrong. It was perfect. It was amazing. It created these huge companies that... I also agree with that. Yeah. Because I think the fact that it's an ecosystem mm -hmm. means that my Google products work perfectly. Seamlessly, my Apple right? My Apple product, perfectly. right? I would never buy a non-Apple product right now because of the ease of use of my Apple products, right? So I got here to Barcelona, realized that I was I had my earphones in all the time. So my Air, my Apple AirPods were bothering me because um, they were just in my ears all the time. So I was looking for a set of over-the-ear headphones. Yes, Apple has a set. They're very expensive. I've heard that they're too heavy, so I didn't buy them. So I bought Beats. Well, Beats is owned by Apple. You would think <laughs> that they would work so seamlessly with Apple products, and they don't. They don't work as well as my AirPods in terms of like switching from device to device, right? So like, yes, this ecosystem and the, uh, the fact that everything is kind of, you know, is coordinated and closed has huge benefits. You know, my business runs on Google Apps. So, you know, we have, we have a, you know, Google for Business account and everything runs on Google and it's seamless. And so there are huge advantages of that, of, of the Apple ecosystem or the Google ecosystem. Absolutely. But yes, there are also real disadvantages. And for me... I don't have a huge premium on privacy. I have, you know, because I've been working in on the internet for so long. Um, I was a super early adopter, you know, way back in the day, early, early, early dial up AOL. I had my AOL account, you know, I have been on the internet since the very beginning and, you know, and dial up networks before that. And, um, and I've lived a fairly public life. Like I've not tried to, to keep, you know, anything from public view. So, um, so as a result, I have never assumed that I have privacy. And so 12 years ago when I had my son, my husband and I were writing a house blog at the time that, you know, people had started to share outside of our family. First, it was just for the family and friends. And then suddenly some strangers started to read it and comment. And we had our son. We're like, should we not put him on there? Should we not say his name? What should we do? And we're like, look, you know, we're already pretty public. Like chances are he's going to have a public life, whether he likes it or not. My husband is a really unusual last name where he's like one of six people in the world who has that last name. Like, so, and my son has that name. There's no way in the world that he's not going to have a public life. And so we kind of said, oh, fuck it. Like, whatever. We're going to put stuff on the internet. It'll be fine. Like, and, and we've sort of haven't looked back. Um, 
So I don't have any assumption of privacy. I really don't. And if Google is looking at my stuff, Google, Google can look at my stuff. Fine, whatever, you know. Facebook knows where I am all the time. Yeah, whatever. It's kind of, for me, it's the cost of doing business because I work on Facebook. I can't not be on Facebook. Um, so yeah, I there's good and bad. I do think they're too big in some ways and I would like to see much more regulation of them. But as far as breaking them up, I'm not sure that that's really going to happen. And if it happens, I want some of it, but not all of it. You know, I want my products to stay together and I don't want other products. You know, I can't have it both ways. Right. I have to either be for um, breaking up the monopolies or I have to be for keeping them together. And um, I don't know if I really have an opinion one way or the other, but I'm mixed. I'm quite mixed, too. But my worry where. I, I sense you don't have you don't have as big of a worry about this is 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 a bit of big government um, because of my background where I'm from it's like I'm I'm not very trustful of government I guess as a teenager when I first came to Europe I was like I was like I'm a libertarian I was like, now I'm like okay yeah no, 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 not not maybe I'm not a libertarian but still I'm not a big fan of governments uh, you know doing a little uh, digging into my into my stuff. Understandably. Yeah. So do you think it was a bad move that, that, that the internet became less anonymous? I mean, the way big tech tries to defend this is that people chose to. And I agree. Even in Iran, where, you know, initially everyone was using uh, nicknames and everything was private on the forums and everything. Now people are just very public about it and they get into political and legal trouble because of what they post on social media. Sure. Was that a bad turn or a good turn overall, internationally? <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, I think anonymity an, an, anonymity? <laughs> I think anonymity has um, declined as the rise of creator culture has emerged. And so 10 years ago, 15 years ago, on the internet, if you were anonymous, you were creating your stuff and people were consuming it and it was all fun and interesting and maybe you were contributing something and um, and you had followings and that was cool. But as time has gone on and as influence marketing has developed, um, there's now a bit more, it's become more um, transactional, like the internet has become more transactional, I think, and fame and uh, popularity have become more more transactional. And so, and I'm not sure I'm going to articulate this really well, but here's the thought, that people don't want to be anonymous anymore because they can't monetize anonymity. And so if you are an amazing TikTok creator and you're doing super cool stuff, a brand will notice you. And that brand might hand you money to do something for them or at least send you product or do something else. So you've, you've risen in popularity on any platform, but let's say TikTok. And now, and maybe you're anonymous. TikTok is a little hard to be anonymous because it's probably you on screen, but let's just say you're anonymous. And now somebody wants to do business with you. Well, it's very hard to do business with something, with an entity that's anonymous, right? You kind of have to do business with a person or at least a company. And so with this rise of creator culture and people creating and wanting to get paid for their creating in one way or another, either through sponsorships or through product or through actual marketing fees or because their fans are paying them to create as you do with, 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 um, with your, um, uh, well, the, 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 the podcast and the... Uh, yeah, and right. The, and the, but what's the platform? Oh, you, pa Patreon. Patreon, thank you. Yes. Totally couldn't, yes. <laughs> As you do with Patreon, you know, like you're a creator and you want to at least subsidize the cost yeah. of making the content, right? Mm -hmm. If not get, not make money off of it, you want to subsidize the cost of it. So, and I think that that's true of many, many creators now. And that's sort of this whole creator culture is growing. And it is very hard to do that and remain anonymous, right? It is very hard to do both. So you can continue to be anonymous. I have a great example for you. Um, there's a beautiful Twitter account called Duchess Goldblatt. Have mm -hmm. you ever heard of it? No. It's at Duchess Goldblatt, G-O-L-D-B-L-A-T-T. -T. And um, she is a pseudonym for, or she's she's a, a character 
who is an 80 something year old um, grand dame uh, writing about mostly books and culture. Mm -hmm. And she's very acerbic and witty and has very wry observations on the world um, and does a lot of stuff about literary culture as well. And she's anonymous. And um, last year, last year, 2020, she had a book come out that hit the best bestseller lists and won a ton of awards. And it was like her memoir about becoming Duchess Goldblatt. And it won humor awards and it won literary awards. And she remains anonymous. Now we know now that she's like a 30 something woman writer, um, but we don't know anything more than that. Um, and this person gave, the, the person behind the account gave interviews as Duchess Goldblatt, I think, I think she gave them as or like sent interviews in on her on the duchess's behalf um for when the book came out so like there are people who are still creators and are anonymous like it, it does happen um but i think it's harder to do and less obvious where you can go with it um and so i think that that i think as creator culture has risen anonymity has dropped and you know if creator culture were to lessen you know, then maybe people would come back and do fun things, cool things like Duchess Goldblatt. You know, maybe there will be more people to do that. But I'm not so sure. I think people want to get paid for what they do now. And that's the norm. I guess the the, the, the sort of underlying reason I asked all these questions was to see whether um, you as an American, let's say, are concerned about how much of us is out there, how much of, of our data is out there and what, under the wrong political circumstances, what could be done with that? Yeah, that's scary. Um, and I don't have an answer. I, I mean, for me, I'm just a little speck in the universe, right? And so for my personal individual data, like who wants with it? Whatever, go go at it, go do something. You know, they would steal my credit card. Fine, I'll cancel my credit card. I've got protection, right? You know, like uh, for me personally, on a micro micro level, like whatever. Yes, the information's out there. On a macro level, there it is clear from what's happening, especially like in the political sphere and with all this misinformation, that if you know that somebody is somewhat inclined to follow a radical ideology. You know, or that because of the groups that they're in or the forms that they're in, you can target them. And maybe you're not targeting that one person, you're targeting that group of people. And you can really uh, clearly, as evidenced by our last few elections in the United States, cause havoc by targeting particular groups and by really trying to get them, get uh, sway their opinions and, you know, in some cases, radicalize them towards perhaps violence. So, um, that's very scary stuff. And that's happening kind of on the macro aggregation of information that um, when people have, when bad actors can see this group of people are going in this direction, they can make it worse, right? They can push them even harder. And I think, and that's very scary to me. But on a super micro level, like, you know, for my, for myself, for you, like, what are they going to do with your data, Roham? Like, who cares, right? You, you, you. I mean, yes, you are an Iranian, you know, expatriate. But like, is somebody going to come and do something with your stuff? Are you really, are you really worried about that for you, or are you worried about it more globally? I'm very worried about it personally. Like, the, the, I'm, I'm, um, quite frankly, I'm risking my neck, literally, um, saying a lot of stuff that I'm saying online. I haven't said enough yet. I, may, I may or may not say more than I am right now. Uh, but but on, you're on here. Iranian but street. you're here now. I, now I know uh, yeah. you do have family back in Iran, right? Yes. So it is dangerous for them. I mean, for, I, I'm worried about Iran. Yes, but outside of that, you know, not that long ago, uh, Spain was run by a fascist government, and the Soviet Union was still a thing. You know, um, it's kind of like well, and Russia still is a thing. <laughs> and Russia is still a thing. And China. Yep. It's it's very easy for this democracy that we have here or in, in, in the US to, to break up. And then, um, you know, whoever comes into power might not like what I said 10 years ago or five years ago or whatever. That's what worries me. Uh, I think that's true. And I 
look, we've just come out of four years in the United States where I really lived in fear. You know, I'm I'm Jewish. I am the child of Holocaust survivors. I have German citizenship because of the Holocaust. My grandparents got their German citizenship back, restored after you know many many years because they had been kicked out of Germany. My grandfather was in a was in Buchenwald for six weeks before they let him go because he already had a visa to come to, to the United States. So like I have a family that lived through the worst of of dictatorship and fascism and hate. And um, those those lessons have been very deeply ingrained in me. And um, it's what caused my family to become extremely liberal, extremely democratic. Um, my grandfather was a civil rights pioneer in Chicago and marched, uh, did, went to the March on Washington with, with uh, Martin Luther King and was a dear friend of Jesse Jackson's all of his life and like really believed in civil rights, really believed in human rights and passed that and passed that those feelings down to, to all of us in the family. So I, so I, so I understand where you're coming from because, but for literally a couple of weeks and a righteous Gentile in Frankfurt who managed to make it so that my grandfather could leave Germany I would not be here, right? Like literally the space of a few weeks was the difference between me being here and not being here. So I'm a little bit emotional about that. Um, so I understand that really well. So when Trump came into power, my husband and I, my son and I have German passports. My husband does not, but he could have come with us. He's, you know, he travels with us um, as a spouse and Trump came into power. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States. We started to get really worried. Our son, you know, was in Hebrew school. We were going to synagogue, you know, regularly and, you know, clearly Jewishly identified. So you, you, uh, can I ask if you're, yeah. you're religious in terms of... We're not particularly religion? religious. We're culturally Jewish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but our son is going to be, he's going to have a bar mitzvah in January and he's he's in Hebrew school and um, learning about the culture and learning language, a little little bit kind of learning language. Um <laughs> And and my husband and I have both been to Israel a number of times, and um, he was much more Jewishly educated than I was. But yes, we live we live I would say a relatively secular, but Jewish life. Um, and so Trump can, comes to power. There's all this anti-Semitism in the world, and my husband and I kind of looked at each other and said, "What are our choices?" You know, there were a lot, a lot of my friends who were really, really worried. We're like, how do we get to Canada, right? How do we move to Australia? Like, how do we get out of here? And we actually had an escape route because we had European passports. We still have European passports. And we said, wouldn't it be ironic? Like, the biggest irony of the world would be that to escape fascism in the United States, we would move to Germany. <laughs> yeah, that would be. And that was a really realistic possibility at the time. And it was about that time that I started coming here to teach at Harbor Space in 2017. So like I came right after the inauguration of Trump. And then I started coming here. And so now we would come to Barcelona to escape fascism, not Germany, since we are comfortable here and really know the city. But, um, but it, it would have been really ironic to think that we would have had to go to Europe um, because of our worries about what was happening in the United States. And thank God Joe Biden won the election. You know, it was felt super close there for a little while. I, I mean, I think we were, my friends and I were all fairly confident that he was going to win. The, you know, the numbers looked really good. But the bullshit of this big lie that, that Trump told and continues to tell really damaged the fabric of our society. And um, I don't trust that we will continue to be a democratic society in the United States. It could go another way, could easily. Had Trump won another term, we could have really fallen into dictatorship and fascism and had a lot of our, of our freedom stripped away and had a lot of um, our security stripped away. You don't think so? I mean, I w honestly, I would be the last person to defend Trump uh, <laughs> because of how much pain and suffering has caused uh, for my country and my family. But um, uh, I would be a, I would be a bit more uh, uncomfortable calling him a fascist or his his cult. Let's just say. 
But he allowed and continues to encourage racism and um, anti-Semitism and anti-immigrant um, sentiment to run wild. And the Republicans are as culpable because they are doing nothing to stop it. That to me is wild. The, the fact that uh, just just to not lose the Trump base, uh, I mean, makes sense, but it's wild that this is a thing. Crazy. Honestly, it's wild to me that uh, America, the, 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 you know, the, I guess um, t to the rest of the world, the number one image of freedom uh, and democracy is had these two people uh, as their primary options in the elections. I, I was, I was like, okay, this is this is, this is the second ele election that I'm old enough to actually understand, and yeah. like, I would not vote for any of those people in a normal world. Like, I would not want any of the three people that have run for election over the past eight years to be the leader of my country. Yes, yeah, see, and, and I adored Hillary Clinton and adore Joe Biden and think that they're both amazing, brilliant, super smart um, people who are amazing managers, which I think is really important for a president, you know, people who can find, truly find the best people and amass the greatest cabinet and the greatest um, support team. And I think they... I'm confident Hillary would have been able to do that had she been given the chance. And I am loving what Joe Biden is doing in terms of, of, of who he has around him. And I strong, I'm, I'm, I'm such a liberal Democrat, you know, that I really, I, I understand the very progressive wing. I understand what Alexander, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wants and, you know, others in the liberal, super liberal wing. I get that. And I don't disagree with that. I'm also a realist, and I think that Joe Biden, who is left of center, is doing everything that he possibly can realistically um, to really move the country forward. I, lo I love that he is spending the money that he's spending. I'm a big believer in social systems and social welfare. I'm a big believer in education and, uh, and you know, paid leave and... Um, you know, ch uh, anything that supports children and, you know, like all of those social fabric pe part pieces of the social fabric that we have not had, I think are so vital to, to our success. And I'm very excited that he's putting them in now. He may not get all of what he wants. He will not get all of what he wants for sure. Um, but wow, thank God he got his COVID bill through because look at this, like here in Spain, Probably waited another six months for my vaccine if I stayed here, maybe more. So you already got your vaccine? No, no. I just got, I got called two weeks ago in Chicago. I mean, I'm not there, right? But two weeks ago, they told me I was eligible for my vaccine in Chicago. I will get my vaccine like the week I get back. Yeah, the vaccine situation in Europe is appalling. It's terrible. It's appalling. But it would have been terrible had Trump stayed in power too. Of course. I mean, disastrous. But, you know... On specific issues, I may not necessarily agree with you, but I'm not an American, so it's not really my place anyway to to discuss them. But I like hearing your opinion. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, but what worries me really about America is that um, it, it, this is basically what's happened to Europe, and you know we're seeing the consequences with vaccines. There's no vision. There's no like, okay, the next four years, cool. I don't like four years is what not on, on the larger scale. Four years is nothing, even for a young country like America. Yeah. What are you going to do for the next 20 years, for the next 30 years, for the next 50 years? What's the plan to continue being the most innovative, the most prosperous country, the most you know, the leading country in the world? That I don't see with Biden or Trump or any anyone in the Democratic or the Republican Party. I, I see some of it with Biden. I definitely didn't see it with Trump. I mean, Trump was like, show me the money. That was all that he cared about. I mean, he had, he seemed to have a vision, at least in his campaigns, but the vision was uh, appalling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. So um, with Biden, I think that the, I mean, my understanding is, uh, w the way that I see it is that the money that he wants to spend on our social infrastructure and, and our, and our physical infrastructure is a new deal type of, of, of um, plan that he really is looking to change the way that the United States, you know, in terms of energy, in terms of, of environmental um, 
friendliness in terms of you know raising the most educated workforce in, in the in the world in terms of you know giving our children the best possible start you know those are the kinds of things that i think if he's able to pass what he wants to pass in terms of spending and legislation will do that now is it a 30 year vision i don't know is it a 10 year vision yes um and my sadness is that he probably won't get most of what he wants because we have such a divided government. I don't think that Joe Biden's vision is grand. You know, I don't see him articulating like, you know, it, it, the moonshot. You know, mm -hmm. I don't I don't see that necessarily. I'm also very practical and realistic. And I know that he's not going to get everything that he wants, not anywhere close to everything that he wants in this divided Congress. And so as a result, I am happy with the vision of um, paid, paid leave for parents, you know, like to me, that would be a huge win in the United States is to be able to, you know, um, you know, more early childhood intervention and paid leave for parents and um, improve our still completely crappy healthcare system. Like if we can do those things, if we can do a few of those things in the next four years or hopefully the next eight or more, I will be happy. I think that would be great. At the same time, my family and I are very likely moving to Barcelona next year. And our medical coverage in the United States costs us about $25,000 a year. And it's not transferable, I'm assuming? To... No, but that's kind of like, we're going to save $25,000 by moving here. Wow. And just a family of three. Family three. Twenty five thousand. That's we how pay, much our medical cover coverage costs. I think we pay like two hundred a month <laughs> for our insurance here. Yeah, and they cover everything. Any surgery, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for for the most basic, I mean, we have very good coverage. You know, we can kind of get whatever we need. But when you count our monthly premiums plus the deductible plus anything out of pocket, we have to save about twenty five thousand dollars a year. Now, I'm self employed. That's part of the problem, right? That I I um and. I make too much money to be on the Obamacare exchange, right? So we're kind of in between, right? We're in a weird, weird, weird place in, our, in the medical system. But that's the point is that our medical system is so crazy, you know, that that still happens, you know, that there are still families, many, many, many families like mine that are paying more than their mortgages for medical coverage and medical care. So, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so while we're on this topic, America is a very, very weird place. Uh, I mean, it has a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed. Uh, yeah. You know, some some policies on the right I agree with, some policies on the left I agree with. But I think in general, there's so much to be fixed in America for it to continue being a leading country, or some may argue get back to being a leading country. But um, to me, it's really exciting. I find the idea of America right now, where it, where it's at, I, I like crisis. I like a bit of chaos. I like it. I, like, I find it fun. It's, I would much rather uh, be there. Like, I, I don't think I would have much fun living in a Scandinavian country, for example. There's too much peace. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be your argument for or against someone like me, you know, young, but, you know, with my background, Iranian and whatever, uh, moving to America? So, um... I think there's pros and cons, of course. As you're thinking about moving to America, I'm thinking about moving to Europe. And, you know, um, uh, there's, the grass is always greener, you know, like you always think it looks better on the other side. Um, but I would say for a young person, particularly if you have the opportunity, um, one thing that I tell people, I lived in New York for 18 years, New York City, and... I tell every young person that I've met, he, he, even here at Harbor Space, like if you ever get the chance to go move to New York City, go do it. You know, like there's there's opportunities there. It's a lifestyle that you will not experience probably in any other country in the world. I haven't been to Tokyo. Maybe it's kind of like Tokyo. Maybe it's, you know, there's a few other cities like that. But but for the most part, I don't know of another city like that. It's London-ish, but even it's more than London. Um and so if you ever have the opportunity, I think young people should go for a year. Just like rough it for a year because it's roughing it for sure. It's really expensive. But if you can do it, I think it's great. So 
extrapolate that out a little bit bigger to like, should you go to the, the United States for a year or more? Like, what are the opportunities and what would you get from that? And I think you would get a lot in terms of the multiculturalism, you know, the diversity, um, especially if you're going to a city that's not, that's, that is diverse, um, you know, that you're not going to a little small, you know, southern oh. I was thinking town. Austin or Boston or yeah. some somewhere around that. Yeah, town. Austin. I mean, Austin is an amazing city with with tons of startups and tech and a really great youth culture and fabulous music and food and it's a it's a fantastic city. It is in a red state. There are disadvantages of that, you know, right now. Or advantages. Or advantages, you, depending. Yeah. Um, the disadvantages have, of living in Texas were quite apparent this year when their infrastructure fell through completely because they're. Republican gover government didn't ever want to spend on it. And so they were without power and water in the middle of a snowstorm for two weeks. So if you're willing to put up with that, go to Texas. I, I mean, I'm saying that very facetiously, right? But, you know, there are there are advantages and disadvantages of every place that you could go. Um, uh, Boston is a really cool city. I, I find it a little insular sometimes. Like, you know, kind of Bostonians sometimes can be a little cold to outsiders. But at the same time, maybe too many academics. Is that the... no? No, I think that's cool. I grew up in. An, I mean, I grew up in an academic town. But um, yeah, I think. But Boston. I mean, it's a very vibrant city. It's really close to New York too. You know, lots of other cool things on the East Coast to do, and it's a great, great base to do it from. Um, Washington D.C. is really cool, um, and you know, obviously super political, and a company town. You know that everybody works in politics. Um, Atlanta, really up and coming, really lots of really amazing culture, huge film industry growing there, um, great businesses headquartered there. So, and then Chicago, my hometown of Chicago, um, which is becoming a real tech city and um, phenomenal architecture, really great music scene, great food, great nightlife. Um, or you could go to California <laughs> and there's lots there too. So, I, I mean, there are a lot of places to go. Um, all of them have their own charms. I would say if you get to the United States, travel, because there's a huge, huge country with lots and lots of different cultures. And um, it's probably kind of like the difference between Madrid and Barcelona, right? That Barcelona has, you know, clearly a really different culture than Madrid. And I would say many of the cities in the United States have that same kind of divide. Yeah. This was a weird tangent. <laughs> But basically the goal is for me, I think... I'm going to, for the next few years, um, mm -hmm. until I can be sure that now I'm, I want to settle and start a company or whatever, like start a proper startup. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I want to first take a road trip throughout Europe, go to all the major cities and interview people for this podcast, and then probably go to America, repeat the same uh, travel like drive through the country and, and interview people that, that that's cool yeah it seems like a cool goal seems yeah. like something exciting that i can that i can work towards yeah yeah to, to taking a step back from this uh, tangent um one of the uh, points that we touched on is that there are, there is a lot of division and this division potentially is a lot caused by by social media are you worried about you know We had, for example, this this way of uh, the, the Trump uh, telling this this election, bringing up this election fraud, uh, was a form of cancel culture, <laughs> and you have the same on the left, happens a lot. Yeah. On the right, happens a lot. In general, we seem to be falling into uh, tribes, uh, like really really strong tribes that are getting harder and harder to break up. Um, how how scared are you about? the people becoming judge, jury, and executioner on the internet um, or mobs becoming judge, jury, and execution executioner in the long term. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, cancel culture has really gotten, it's run amok. You know, this whole idea of being canceled is, is um, you know, it, it, if you make a little misstep, you know, you could be quote unquote canceled, right? You say something wrong once and you're never, you're never forgiven. Um, I believe in a culture of making mistakes. <laughs> I really want, I want to believe for myself that I can make mistakes and recover from them. But in today's environment, that might not be true because I'm a, a relatively public person. I don't hide a lot of things. And who knows, somebody could be listening to this podcast. One of my clients could be listening to this podcast and decide that I said the wrong thing and never forgive me for it and fire me. And that could be a cause a cascade, right? God forbid. I hope that that does not happen. 
Um, but it could, and I know of people that have been canceled for various reasons. A friend of mine um, was canceled for something that was filmed of her and manipulated and um, lost her job, moved out of her city, um, like really the kind of the worst of what could happen to an individual. Um, and the truth of whether or not she did or said what she did, I don't really know what the truth is. I just know that the extreme happened to her and I feel like it was incredibly wrong. And I know that that happens to many people all the time. Now, are there things that should be canceled? Yeah, there probably are opinions or um, not opinions, but movements that should be um, diminished um, in a way. Um, do normal, do, do other movements have the right to basically battle each other? Well, anybody can battle. I, I mean, right? Free speech. It's a free country. You can battle. But to say like that, uh, well, uh, I'm, maybe I'm getting this example wrong. So you'll, we'll fact check this a little later. Um, to say that Matt Gates, who's this U.S. politician coming under a great deal of fire right now, he's a Republican, darling of, of Trump, mm -hmm. um, big supporter. He had met lots and lots and lots of airtime on Fox News over the, of the last years. Um, he's now being found to have had sex with underage girls and paid a lot of other women for sex. And, of course, the right is screaming that Matt Gates is getting canceled. Uh, was he... Uh... Is he? Is it just an accusation, or has there been any trial? Oh, oh his associates going. His associate has flipped. Like a, the person that he was involved in this with okay. is said to be talking to the to the feds about it, and it is seems clear that this information is going to be coming out against Matt Gates. There, there is a lot of information. This is not just like one woman accusing him of one thing, right? There is a lot of documentation of this. Are we canceling? Are we? Is the, le is the left canceling Matt Gates? No. <laughs> the left is accusing Matt Gates of wrongdoing and asking legitimate questions about whether or not a sitting U.S. representative should be allowed to continue to hold his seat in the face of these incredible fel felonious felony accusations, right? Any reasonable person would say this guy is going to be tried as a felon he should not be in his seat. But the right is screaming, cancel, cancel, cancel. You know, what I find funny is that, uh, is this, this the language of left and right? Uh, I mean, I, I think I'm seeing it in Europe a little more nowadays. Um, it wasn't as big. In Iran, it's a massive thing. But uh, in America, it's like, okay, especially when politicians say it, it's like, calm down you're a country first of all you're not enemies of each other this language of left and right i really find uh, find weird well the, and, and it's so polarized in the united states right now you know like way more extreme than it was eight years ago or 10 years ago like that polarization is getting worse and worse and worse and so it is very easy to throw ac accusations at each other and just say i'm canceling you i'm canceling you right uh, and and like but it's not about cancel right let's let's change the language we don't want to cancel we want to have a debate you know, we want to really get to the truth. And so if you just cancel, you're doing a disservice to sort of that whole conversation, to the whole idea of public discourse and of, of you know, uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. So if you're canceling something, you're kind of saying none of those people matter. They're not entitled to their opinion. Their opinion is wrong. And I don't, I don't uh, personally, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. And I certainly don't want that to happen to me. On the, on the debate side, there was, I think, a massive surge. I mean, with podcasting, and right now we're, we're sitting here and have different political ideas and mm -hmm. are discussing them. But there was also a surge on the sort of mainstream level, um, on like the North American side, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, or if you know uh, Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. for example. Um, he, he really like revamped something like that with his debates, for example, with Sam Harris, who's more yep. on the on the left uh but even those debates <laughs> keep getting uh, attacked let's just say um like i mean i don't agree with everything the guy says i like i think i found a lot of his uh, ideas helpful but for example his book the, the publishing company was trying to uh, the, the employees of 
Penguin were trying to cancel the book's publication. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, live and let live, people. You know, like, like the. There are some parts of society right now that are harmful, right? That are clearly doing harm to particular populations. And they need to be reined in in some way, right? And if that's by public opinion, if that's just not spending your money in in whatever that is, you know, uh, let's take the 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 um Georgia voting restrictions that have just been voted in. Um I am all for the companies that are headquartered in Georgia saying f you to those to to those restrictions and saying like we want a georgia where everybody gets to vote and yes we are going to tell you georgia legislature how we feel this is our opinion about it and yes we might not have as much we might not put as much money into your state unless you're going to change and that's what happened with a lot of like a couple of years ago like transgender bathroom bills mm -hmm. right in north carolina there was this transgender there was this bill restricting um, people, they only could go into the bathrooms of their natural born gender, right? And a bunch of companies, including I think that year it was might have been the NBA All-Star Game, pulled out of North Carolina. And not immediately, but over time, that bill was either, I can't remember if it was pulled back or over overturned, or I don't remember what happened with it exactly. But like companies had the power, because people wanted them to, companies had the power to go in and say, we, we think you're on the wrong side of history here, right? We think you're on the wrong side of humans here and we want you to change. And that was, that was successful. And it's been successful in other places too. So we individuals can go to people who hold more power than we do, which would be companies or in some cases, legislatures or other groups that have a big voice and make our desires known. And in, in Georgia, it seems clear you know, like 75% of people in Georgia want those laws removed, right? So when the vast majority of Georgians think that these laws are restrictive and harmful, absolutely, I want the companies to come in and say, uh-uh-uh, not so fast, Georgia. And are we now canceling Georgia's legislature? No, we are not doing that, right? We're having a public discourse about it. Many people, many, many different groups have a, a, have an input in it, and we are doing exactly what we should be doing and using our voices to encourage what 75% of the population wants to have happen, right? So, so I, like, that, that's, that's the right way to go about it from my point of view, right? I want to see change. I'm going to go after the people that can help me make change. But ethically, I mean, legally, obviously, it's freedom of speech, uh, but ethically, is it okay for companies to get so involved in politics as they are They're today. not involved in politics. That's not politics. Involved in politics is the companies giving all the money to politicians. That's involved in politics. Democratically involved in politics, let's okay. just say. But yes. just, just through their PR and through their uh, I think, uh, look, if I am a company, look, I am, I am a Chicago company, right? I am headquartered in Chicago. I pay my taxes in Illinois. I'm a Chicago company. I'm a teeny, teeny, tiny Chicago company by comparison to others. But don't I get a say in how the money that I contribute to the state is used for state programs and services, right? I don't have any lobbying power <laughs> at all. But I could band with my chamber of commerce, my local chamber of commerce, or with the city chamber of commerce to help to affect the change that I believe will make a better business environment for my company. That's totally appropriate, I think. So why wouldn't you know, uh, uh, Delta Airlines headquartered in Georgia who wants the amazing workforce that exists in Georgia to stay with Delta Airlines and continue to work for them. And they want everybody to have a voice, to feel like they're part of society, to feel like they're part of, you know, the voting, the voting body that helps set the laws of that state and of our country. Why wouldn't they want the legislature to have greater voting opportunities than less. They pay so much money to that state, right? Their taxes go to supporting all the various programs in that state. They have a right to have an opinion, not to say what happens, but to have an opinion on how that money is spent and how that money is used. Would you use lobbying power if you had it? 
I, I, I probably would. I probably would. Um, it's a good question. Hmm, if I had lobbying power, what would I lobby for? Um, I would. I would. I, um, I want a minimum. I want a stronger minimum wage in the United, in, in Chicago, in Illinois. Um, not universal basic income. Uh, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm intrigued by the idea for sure. I'm not against it, um, but I'm not entirely supportive of it yet. Um, but definitely a, a higher minimum wage. Um, my one of my big issues is maternity leave and paternity leave, um, and more sick time, paid sick leave for families. Um, anything really to support families with children is where my heart's at. And if I had lobbying power, I would do that. I do it in the voting booth for sure. I mean, that's what I vote for. Um, I vote for, you know, open abortion rights. I vote for um, family medical leave. I vote for education. Um, you know, those are those are the things that are important to me. And so my one vote is my lobby. For now. For now. <laughs> um, so... We spoke a lot about the world we live in today and where it's going. You have a you have a you have a son who is growing up in this world of constant connection and constant change. How is how does it feel like to raise a kid in these times? Yeah, well, wow. raising a kid in the internet age. Um, has, as somebody who's been working on the internet for a really long time, when I had my son twelve years ago, I thought piece of cake. I understand the internet. I've ta I've been teaching this. I, I I talk to parent groups like, you know, I I I I got this. Like this is going to be really easy. And boy, is it not. <laughs> <laughs> um kids are super smart, my kid anyway. I I mean, a lot of kids like they're, you know, they ring run circles around their parents in tech, even me. Um even though I work in this every day, I still don't know half of what he knows about some things. Um I mean, Last. even I'm struggling to catch up with people a year or two younger than me. Right, my friends. right, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, so there are new things every day that I have no idea about. Um, there are Minecraft servers and, you know, games and um, things that he wants to connect to that he asks. And I'm like, I'll try to take a look at it. But I'm kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. And who knows, right? Um We did have a little bit of a thing last year when he got into Discord, and I didn't realize how open Discord was. I'm on Discord myself for for various groups, um, but didn't realize but that by allowing him on Discord, it was really opening him up to pretty much everything on the internet and very, very, very hard to monitor. Um, and so as a result, he got into some things that I didn't want him to be involved with, some kind of unsavory things and met some unsavory people. And, um, we had to lock it down pretty hard. We took it away. A lot of tears, like, but my friends are there and that's how I talk to them. And of course, you know, he was going to school in a pandemic. So he was online hundred percent of the time. That's how all of his friends were talking to each other. And, um, but they were talking to other people as well. That was the problem. And so we took it away. We locked his computer down really hard. We've got strict parental controls on his computer. And if he tried to download Discord again, we'd know it, we'd know it in an instant. And do I like doing that? No, I'd rather not. I'd rather not have to censor my child, but he's 12 mm -hmm. and he needs it. And I don't want, you know, he was 11 at the time. I don't want him to see things that he shouldn't see or be involved in conversations that he shouldn't be involved in until he's older. I guess I had a similar experience. I mean, my mom never blocked any websites, but the government did it for her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wasn't allowed to have a VPN until we came. I mean, here we wouldn't. I didn't need a VPN. So my mom basically, it was well timing because when I came here, I was 13. I was old enough to be able yeah. to manage myself. Uh, but that was when I had my intro to to uh, the open, you know, Wild West style right. internet. On Discord though, I love Discord. It's amazing. And I basically lived in it during quarantine yeah. <laughs> with my friends. Uh, but yeah, that that place is, is, is tough. You can join anything, right? It's, and and my son did. Yeah. And um, so, and it was just really hard as a parent to monitor, you know, even if I was logged in as him, I wasn't seeing all of his messages and he was deleting things. And so, um, and I think a lot of parents of kids like 10, 12, you know, 10, 12, 13, 
their kids are like, I want to go on Discord. All my friends are there. And the parents are like, sure. And they have no idea, no idea what that means. And look, if you're not going to let your kid join Instagram or you're not going to let your kid join, you know, TikTok, TikTok, I mean, I think a lot of kids do, both Instagram and TikTok, a lot of kids do have accounts under 13. But if you've got, if you're like, oh, no, 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 you can't join social media, but oh, sure, go join Discord, you have a problem, right? And there were so many parents of my kids' friends in my in my kids' class that had no idea what Discord was or what it what it, it in, included or where you could go go from there or like the kinds of content you could get to. And I think it was really shocking and eye-opening to them to find it out. Um, so, yeah, I, and, and not to say that Discord is evil. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was just the platform of choice for my kid. And I'm sure there's plenty of other places that other kids get into worse trouble even than that. Um, but, yeah, it's scary. It's a very scary time um, to have kids kind of loose on the Internet. And they're growing up much, much faster than I would like them. At least my son's growing up faster than I would like. Um, I, you know, and, and of course at 12, there are days that he's a cuddly, you know, baby talking, cuddling his social stuffed animal kind of, you know, wants to cuddle with mama kind of kid. And then there's days that I know that he's looking at porn and, (laughs) you know, it's that age. Um, and there's not much I can do about it and it's fine, you know, but, um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, my younger brother, when he wanted to go look at porn, he had to go find my grandfather's stash of Playboys in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a really different time. Yeah. And uh, so it's 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 tough. It's tough as a parent to know when to put restrictions in and when to limit and when to block and when not to. Going back 12 years, what was it like to first see your kid? Hmm. I was amazed. I was really amazed. Um, I was 41 when I had him. I didn't know if I was going to have kids. It wasn't clear. Um, wasn't clear because I wasn't, um, in the right relationship. And then it wasn't clear because I was 40 when I started trying to get pregnant. Um, and there he was. And, um, I was like, wow, I made that. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, my husband also wasn't sure that he wanted kids and, uh, he's a couple of years older than I am, so it was a little bit of a miracle. Like it was kind of, it, it was, it was pretty amazing. I still am amazed. Like I made that. Wow! And he's smart, and he's funny, and he's clever, and that's like, how did I, how did I affect that? Like it's pretty amazing every day. I'm gonna ask a, a bit of a philosophical question. What's the meaning of it all, <laughs> of life? Wow. Of you know, uh, the world that we've built. What's the meaning of life? 42? <laughs> yeah. That's what my son was say. He's all into Hitchhiker's Guide lately. Um, what's the meaning of life? Well, in this personal growth work that I've been doing the last few years, like I've really started to understand my why. You know, like why Why am I here? Why, why am I doing, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I uh, the person that I am? And, um, so for myself, I think, you know, my vision really is to be a, a person of integrity that makes a difference in the world. Um, that's my personal mission statement in a nutshell. And um, I want to be in relationships. I want to, with with people, with many people, um, uh, I want to um, inform and educate which I do through my teaching here at Harbor Space, but also through the marketing coaching that I do and with my clients. And I want to create things. I've always been entrepreneurial and I've started many, many businesses and I create things that way, but I'm also a knitter and and a cook. And um, so I like to create. Um, and And I'm a risk taker. I, I'm willing to take risks. I'm w- willing to go out on a limb. I'm willing to do different kind of crazy things. So that's me personally. And what it leads to for me as the meaning of life is like carpe diem. You know, like you, life is, life is adventure. Life is an adventure. Um, and we're here. Who knows why? You know, like I said, but for a few weeks in, in, in the Holocaust, 
you know, a quirk of fate, a, a, a righteous Gentile willing to write a paper for my grandfather, I would not be here. So the chances of me not being here are great, but I'm here. So I want to do cool things. I want to be in relationship with great people. I want to be a great person myself. That's to me the meaning of life. Beautiful. I really like that. I mean, uh, I have, last week I, I got to, for the first time in, I don't even know how long, uh, do a little bit of exploration. I went back to Andalusia and I got, uh, with a friend, we, uh, with two, two friends, we rented a car and we just um, drove drove around no one was there because travel okay. was banned but yeah i was gonna say you yeah. know you weren't supposed to go right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but literally like places like alhambra and granada where you're supposed to book six months in advance no one was there like one more family was there yeah um and i got to explore and it's like okay this is life this is the life i want to live i want to just be able to see cool stuff and do cool stuff I don't care about the money or the, the, you know, whatever arbitrary measures. It's just I like I want to smell flowers and I want to eat good food and meet meet cool people. Yeah, that's... yeah. I feel the same. I mean, that's if if this last year in in lockdown has taught me anything, it's that you never know what the next day is going to bring. And so why not do the things that you really want to do? And that's what is going to likely bring us to Barcelona to live. Is I've always wanted to live abroad since I was a kid. And now I have that opportunity. And so if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? So, because I don't want to, I mean, and we could get locked down again tomorrow. Who knows, right? So. <laughs> let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, let's, God, God forbid, we, we, you know, but, but let's, um, but let's do the things that we really want to do now. Because who knows? Who knows? I have this question in my mind. I wasn't sure you would like it, so I didn't even uh, write it in my in my notes. <laughs> I have a feeling that business and marketing people are not necessarily. <sighs> I don't even know how to phrase it. They're not necessarily net positive to the world. I feel like I mean I'm studying high tech entrepreneurship. It's basically a glorified MBA. A lot of my classes are in marketing. A lot of my classes are in finance. Um, I personally now where I am, I want to go in more to, into the technical side. I want to be able to at least somehow understand engineering, be able to do some engineering in software and uh, hopefully other other uh, specifications as well. But in general, I feel like it's the it's the engineering side and technical side that is doing the stuff that are increasing our productivity. And the marketing and the business people add a little a, a layer that is that could be removed of the layer of uh, pardon the language, a layer of bullshit, of of wording and beautiful branding. That if it was removed, maybe our world would be a lot more transparent. Okay, how are you going to sell your product? Who's selling your product? How does it get to the shelves? How does anybody know about it? How does it beat the other product? Why is your product better than somebody else's product? Prove it. Tell me why. <laughs> that was the perfect defense. So capitalism wouldn't work without... No. I, I mean, you can create the coolest shit in the world, right? You can create the perfect widget, like the most amazing widget in the whole wide world. And if all it is is sitting in your in your lab or your apartment or your factory or whatever, what's the point of it? Right? If a tree falls in the forest, you know, like if if it only is sitting in your in your factory, if you can't get it out into the world, what's the point? It's not if you build it, they will come, right? You can't have this cool as shit product over here and just put it out there and wait for people to come to you. It's not how it works. You need business and marketing to make that cool as shit product viable, like to get it out there so that people can see it and find it and buy it. So in that case, how do we make businesses more transparent and keep their PR and marketing department as well? 
transparent i mean for the good of society you know for for the good of knowing that you know knowing what monsanto is doing to the planet and what okay you know. that's a different question so there are companies that are perfectly ethical really you know want to do good in the world companies right um let me see if i get the story right away suitcase do you know the brand away they make these beautiful suitcases and i have two of them i think they're amazing and they are lightweight and functional and stylish and durable and they've really kind of and they're direct to consumer right they're cutting out the middleman and it was the ones with uh, like uh, charger ports and everything yep, in it yep, yeah yeah they were they were the, one of the first mm -hmm. to have charger ports so like by comparison to like a samsonite or a tumi or whatever right who are fine companies right away took away the middleman of the retail store and said mm -hmm. we're going to sell direct to consumer and they're going to be fun and they're going to be cool and we're going to sell you know we're going to sell this the suitcase and I bought in right away, bought one, bought another, bought a little one, like totally believe in the brand. And I think my understanding is that they're an ethical brand. They seem to be concerned about sustainability somewhat. You know, they ship and they say, you know, this was recycled and, you know, here's the cover for it and it's made out of recycled materials and here's the box and be sure to recycle it. Like they're, you know, they're shipping with less packaging, whatever. Maybe not the most sustainable, maybe not the most environmentally friendly, but they're not not doing that and they seemed at least at first to have a pretty good corporate culture you know people seemed really excited to work there it wasn't a huge company and then their ceo female founder ceo is if i'm understanding if i'm remembering this right um found out to have been a real bitch at work mm -hmm. like really an asshole to her employees and she got canceled basically <laughs> right you know she you know like there was an ex expose done it turns out her employee culture was terrible and she was removed from the company now i think she's back which is fine which is fine like you know you go you you make a mistake you learn from it you look you know you learn whatever skills you're missing and you come back i'm pretty sure that that's true but does that mean that this is an evil company because their ceo was a bitch no it's still a good company. They still make good products. They're still innovating. They're still doing stuff that other people aren't doing. They're bringing me a super high quality suitcase at a lower price than some of the others. And and they're shipping it to my door, right? I don't have to go out and look for it. So you can have an ethical company. You can have, you know, that you can have an ethical company that makes mistakes for sure. You know, like maybe we would have found out that they dumped a whole bunch of wastewater in a, you know, something not purposefully, but like this happened, right? Would we say, no, 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 no. They're a terrible company. We don't want to work with them anymore. No. Okay. Say by the same token, this, this CEO screwed up. Are we going to say, no, they're a terrible co company. We're not going to buy from them anymore. No. So I think that there's, there are companies that mean to be ethical and generally are ethical and generally are good places to work and generally good jobs and generally well paid and maybe not maybe they're just at minimum wage in their in their community because that's the norm and they're not $15 an hour or $20 an hour but okay but they're they're still meaning well right and then there's companies that spill chemicals deliberately spill chemicals into the ocean or into the waterways and it's just a business model basically and it's the exactly yeah. exactly and and there is a difference between those two types of companies and so that's where I believe government has a place, right? Government should be regulating to ensure that companies are not spilling their wastewater into our waterways or that they are polluting the air. And so, and government can regulate that more. And I know in the United States, obviously, big issue and, and a huge push now, thank goodness, because Biden is really um, concerned about it. Um, to have more regulation in place. Of course, a lot of people feel like, oh, no, 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 but government shouldn't regulate businesses. But of course they should. They make us wear seatbelts, mm -hmm. right? They make sure that we, you know, that, that our food is safe. And we think that that's fine. I mean, maybe some people don't like wearing seatbelts, but whatever. You know, we, we are willing to put up with those things because we know that it's for the public good. Well, guess what? Protecting our waterways and protecting our air is also for the public good. 
But then, I mean, the US government or any government for that matter is not necessarily transparent enough to be able to tell companies to be transparent about their... You take what you can get, <laughs> right? It's not going to be perfect. So I would rather have stronger prohibitions on dumping wastewater and strong fines and, and a big enough inspection force, you know, a big enough team of people to inspect it than not. And whether the government, whether my government then who's doing that inspection tells me all the truth or not, at least I know that they're looking at it and they're getting some of it or maybe more, most of it. And hopefully they're not involved in it. <laughs> well, yeah. and hopefully they're not involved in it. Yeah. Of course, hopefully they're not involved in it. Yeah. And in some countries, that might be a big question, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I think in most Western countries, you would hope and expect that that wouldn't be the case. Who knows? Maybe I'm naive. I have, I, I have no idea <laughs> either. It's a weird world we live in. I, I'm not a big believer in conspiracy theories. Like... I only, honestly, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm horrified by the amount of conspiracy theories out there right now. <laughs> yes. And, and how um, widely accepted they are, even by yes. people who, like, I used to think that they, they would know better than, than to just believe it. Um, but I, I, now I'm in a position where I'm not, I don't just block out anything because it has the word, name conspiracy on it. Mm -hmm. At least I consider it. Right. Most of them are crap made by people who have no idea what they're talking about. Some of them happen to really open your eyes to like, not no one is the good guy and no one is necessarily just the bad guy. It's like, yeah, that's, they can be helpful. They can be a helpful tool, just like any other. Any. If you, right. I think if you approach any information, all information with an open mind and a willingness to learn, you know, and a willingness to do your own thinking. Anything can be useful, but unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the world that aren't willing to spend the time and the effort, and they just believe whatever is thrown at them. That's the danger. And one of the things that is <laughs> brought on by the internet and yes. the social media. Treatment. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully, as humans, we can find a way. That's that's my hope, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, do you have any book recommendations? I've been reading, reading a lot of really practical books lately um, and um, and not a lot of fiction and not a lot of like thought leadership books really or thought books, but I've read two recently that have impacted my business a great deal. Um, one is Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller mm -hmm. and, um, and it's about marketing and um, principles that I've been teaching for years, but I had never read the book. Like I knew of these principles and I had never sort of seen his whole package altogether. Um, and the idea is that the um, brand is the hero of a story and um, or actually your, your customer um, is on a journey and your brand can impact the customer along the way, just like a movie script or just like a television show or, or a great novel um, and puts the principles of storytelling along the customer's journey. That's so, so just kind of seeing the way that Donald Miller packaged it up, packaged it up and, and reading about it um, was really insightful to me and I've been using it a lot in, in a lot of client work that I've been doing lately. Um, and the other one is um, I'm really changing the way that I'm managing my business. We're growing a great deal right now. We're kind of in this real period of, of, of growth. And, um, and as an entrepreneur who's been running a relatively small business for 11 years, like I needed to take it to the next level. And I read this book, Traction by Gina Wickman. Um, and he teaches something called the entrepreneurial operating system. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a lot of practical common sense stuff sort of wrapped up in a nice bow. Um, and, but I've just really appreciated the way that he's, um, you know, that he encourages businesses to think differently about their businesses, about the people in their businesses, about their goals, about their strategies. Um, and so that's been really helpful to me. And I'm, I'm putting a lot of those principles in place as well. Amazing. I'll check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. This Thanks was for a having. great conversation. This has been delightful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.